Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on operational risk and resilience, and the chapter on integrated risk management. I was a little curious as to the selection that GARP chose for the title of this chapter, Integrated Risk Management, instead of Enterprise Risk Management, because those two ter terms are essentially interchangeable. But remember, as good financial institutions, what are, what are we worried about? We're worried about market risk, we're worried about liquidity risk, and we're worried about credit risk. And then of course, in these last, what is this, five or six or seven chapters, we're worried about operational risk. And so this chapter is really just a, a wrapping up. In fact, that's the title of, uh, of uh, one of the headings inside of the beginning of this chapter. So we're really just deciding how do we you know, kind of throw all these risks together and then put them under some kind of an umbrella framework. And you'll see that as we go through quickly the learning objectives. Boy, we've talked about governance, appetite, and culture in, uh, in a risk framework. So we'll add enterprise risk management to that. We'll talk about regulatory capital and economic capital. And then, boy, it seems to me like we talk about stress testing pretty regularly. And then, you know, GARP is very interested in best practices, challenges, and considerations. So these learning objectives shouldn't be a surprise at all to you. So let's go ahead and start with this uh, ERM. And by the way, it's really interesting how I notice things. Inside of the reading, there's a heading called ERM structure. And so I can't, I can't help but think about term structure, even though they're completely unrelated. But ERM structure and term structure, they sound like they ought to be about the same thing, but, uh, but they're not. So notice the definition there. There's, uh, there's that word integration. So an integrated approach, comprehensive view. Uh, you know, as I was going through the reading, I was thinking about uh, my uh, illustration just a moment ago about the umbrella. And I was thinking to use the word general kind of risk management principles here, but the reading solved it for me. They, they use the term holistic, you know, so that's pretty much what we're trying to do here in this, uh, in this holistic view of risk management. Now, one of the interesting things about this reading that applies in my professional life as a professor, and so it then of course relates to you guys trying to pass some of these, uh, some of these exam questions. Look, uh, look on the outside of this illustration. Uh, we, we've spent some good time talking about risk culture, and we'll do just a little bit more of that here in a second, and risk appetite and risk governance. And so what the chapter tells us is that these are components of a good enterprise risk management framework for all businesses out there. But because of the unique nature of the financial services industry, we have to add that very top one up there risk capital and stress testing. So what that does is that adds the component of resilience into our study of operational risk. So I think that's probably a really, really good question on the exam. So look at that uh, second teardrop point. To be effective, risk governance and culture and appetite, uh, they must be integrated and incorporated and interlocuted and all, all those other kinds of words. Um, one of the things that I thought was fascinating uh, about this reading is the emphasis on the possibility that identification, assessment, mitigation, and monitoring, we've talked about that before, inside of this risk, risk management cycle can be done sequentially, which is kind of the way I always think about stuff because I'm a linear thinker, maybe you guys are as well, and so I do one thing and then I do the next thing and the next thing, but the reading emphasizes that these can be and are often done simultaneously. And as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, you know, so does that mean that we do all four of these functions together? That's what simultaneous means. But I uh, had a little bit of a different takeaway that as we're going through each one of these steps, identification, we ought to be thinking about the other three steps. And maybe assessment is more important to something and mitigation is more important and monitoring is more important. And so, and maybe you guys know this better than I do, that clearly the, uh, the association is emphasizing sequential uh, uh, as well as simultaneous. So make sure that you don't miss a kind of question like that on the exam. Here's just a quick review of, uh, of these three uh, 
elements inside of this structure. So we know what risk governance is, right? Whenever I think of governance, I always think of the board of directors. And then, you know, I think of a flow chart, you know, all the little boxes that go under the board of directors. And so what is that? A set of structures, processes, and pra practices. That makes perfect sense. And then each one of these boxes, there's an outline of, you know, the function and the staffing, and then who gets, who gets to make the decisions. Risk appetite, this goes back to all of my days back in the CFA program where the CFA Institute is very, very interested in candidates knowing the difference between uh, an investor's ability to take with risk and the investor's willingness to take risk, which they can be related, of course, but sometimes they can be completely independent. And so GARP uh, emphasizes this willingness. So remember, risk appetite is the willingness to accept risk. And this probably relates back to some type of a quantitative measure, whether it's expected loss or value at risk or beta or standard deviation or, you know, whatever it is out there. I always, I always use lots of hand gestures, as you know, by watching my recordings. And I always do this to my students when I'm standing in front of the class. I'll say something like, here, suppose this company has this much risk, you know, whatever that means and however that's defined. And so that's, that's, uh, that's risk appetite. But then don't forget the second component of this is that starting with a board and then, you know, working its way down through the chief risk officer and other uh, of the senior executives, we need to figure out what is that acceptable level of risk. You know, so here's our willingness to take risk. And then are we accepting all that risk or are, is it just this much or this much, whatever that is. And then risk culture is described in this chapter, much like it has been in our previous discussions as uh, permeating throughout the organization. It's just not the job of the chief risk officer to determine the values and attitudes and beliefs. Although, of course, it starts with uh, that particular individual, which gets its indication from the board of directors. But then, you know, notice the second part of that description, how people view, manage, assess, communicate, respond to all these kinds of risks. And so I've done this before, you know, I always think about it as, uh, you know, snow falling from, falling from the sky. And uh, what does it land on? Sometimes it lands on the trees way up here. Sometimes it lands on the bushes. And uh, the other day I woke up and there was some s small snowflakes on my little daffodils that are growing out in the front yard. So, all right, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the relationship between each of those elements and, and risk capital, which we'll talk extensively about here in, in just a few minutes. Now, what the chapter does is it reveals several lines of defense in terms of how are we governing you know, what is this set of rules that we're governing all of our risk? Now, remember, what did I say just a moment ago? We've got the market risk, we've got credit risk, we've got liquidity risk, and now we're throwing this operational risk into it. And so I, I don't want you to get too confused with this illustration at the top, but it's very, very clear on starting with the board and then including in that blue box, the senior executives. But then, you know, how, how does an organization, in particular a financial institution, how and when and what are the lines of defenses? And so this is probably a good exam question. You know, think about uh, a question stem and then choice A is first line, choice B is second line, choice C is third line, and choice four is fourth line. So you have these lines of defenses. So it might be helpful for you guys to get out your phone and take a picture of this. So who is that first line? Uh, you know, the business unit management and staff. And so their primary uh, focus is to identify and assess all of those risks. So I think that's an important exam question there. And then, of course, they do all sorts of other things. Notice that last uh, circle point down there, have the authority uh, to expose the organization to risks within the limits of that risk appetite. So then let's switch over to the left. There's that second line, the risk oversight. And think about this as kind of kind of mini umbrellas throughout the organization. I mean, maybe these are maybe these are umbrellas that uh, operate inside of a silo or a business segment. Maybe these are umbrellas that you know kind of leak over to uh, to to over into another silo. You know, I always think about that leaking as as a correlation coefficient or copulas there. 
Um, but notice that bottom left uh, bullet point monitors the risk exposure. All right, so we've got we've got the uh, identify and, and the assessment, and then we have the monitoring over there on the risk oversight, and then risk assurance. So these are all of the individuals, and whenever you Whenever I hear the word audit, I always think of, okay, we're, we're getting the accountants involved. And of course, the accountants are probably going to involve, be involved here, but it's not going to be just a, you know, a regular old accountant who knows the difference between a debit and a credit. But these are accountants who know all about risk and expected exposure and all that kind of stuff. But then we have, as the chief of this risk assurance, is going to be, of course, the chief risk officer. So what happens then? We have these lines of defenses and then look up, we're pushing up assertions on the status of risk exposure. So we have all of these lines of defense that are saying, okay, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is the risks. Maybe it's this much, right? Let me do this again with my hand gesture. And then what can we do? We, we report up, we assert up, and we assure up. Then we just have a really, really fascinating uh, chapter on reporting. So this should make perfect sense. So this is not really, uh, here, let me go back here real quick. So what are we doing here? We're in this risk management cycle, right? And this is the important part of making certain that these things can be done simultaneously or sequentially. So we're not really in the cycle like we are here where we're in the cycle, but we're pushing upwards towards uh, towards the, the senior executive leadership team and, and the board of directors. All right, moving on to culture, what did I say? You know, of course, the chief risk officer is, uh, is the lead individual on all of this, but gets the direction from uh, the board of directors and also other executive leaders because, right, you know, we operate inside and outside of all of these silos. But the reading emphasizes this, and I think this is an important point. Look at the last arrow point down there that this extends, this risk culture extends way beyond, I'll put my own little uh, word in front of beyond, way beyond any operational risk incidents because what we can do is we share lessons. I think I emphasized this in, in uh, just a recent uh, recording in which we know we have one silo over here and we're learning re lessons about risk management. And, and maybe this is just simple, old, suppose this silo is commercial lending. And inside of that silo, we have uh, you know, different levels of commercial lending. And so we say, all right, here's, here, here's a level between, let's just take some small example, you know, loans between 50,000 and $250,000. And so we have, you know, that credit risk inside of there. And so we have, let's suppose that we have some borrowers who run into some problems. Maybe it's inflation, maybe it's COVID, maybe it's whatever it is. And we can learn that lesson. This is the risk culture. We learn that lesson by helping the the silo over here. Maybe the silo over here is uh, the ATM management. You know, how can we learn? And of course, there are linkages there. There are copulas and there are correlation coefficients. And so I think you know, good exam questions are probably the extension beyond just individualized and what might appear to be independent operational risk incidences that can work through corporate traditions, behavior, personal ethics, and predisposition to risk on a personal level. Now, how important are risk cultures and risk governance? So what the reading does is it shares a study and shows something like, hey, let's go ahead and identify some shortcomings inside of this governance Boy, that look at the check marks there. You're, you're not surprised. Inadequate oversight, unclear accountabilities. You know, some somewhere in there, there has to be something like, "Hey, we're probably not communicating well." Remember, GARP is super uh, concerned about communication. So what that means is lack of ownership of key risks, which means if we're not really owning those key risks, like the credit risk over here in my earlier example, then we're clearly not going to communicate them. Boy, complex, you know, that, right, so we have all these different uh, silos. Boy, we need to communicate and we need to overcome uh, the bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, of course, we hear bureaucracy most often as associated with government. 
And so we think of this United States federal government as this, you know, gigantic uh, behemoth of an animal. And of course, at a much smaller level, these huge bank holding companies and financial institutions, I mean, they can suffer. They can suffer from the same kinds of bureaucratic red tape, so to speak. But look at that very last uh, part of the sentence, poor risk management. Now let's move on to risk appetite. So this is my hands right here. What are we doing with my hands? So risk appetite, uh, prepared to accept, relevant for, well, I just went over those, right? Credit, market, and liquidity, and operational risk. I, you know, I, I can't help but think here in 2023 that when I mention uh, market risk, we have to worry about, let's suppose that we're a bank. I won't mention any bank's names. And we have $90 billion in uh, U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, which probably have pretty low, if not zero, credit risk. But they have tremendous market risk. And as we're seeing, probably some liquidity risk. And so the operational risk, uh, that human element there, that throws back over into all those. So, I mean, this is a timely, timely learning objective. Uh, especially with this, the, the scandals going on in 2023. But of course, poor interest rate risk management has not just been invented in, uh, in 2023. It goes all the way back to, uh, I don't know, thousands of years probably. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the three elements at the bottom. So we have this, this, and this, right? So here's our acceptable risk. Here's our risk appetite in red. And then our, here's our risk capacity. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what is our risk tolerance and then what is our threshold. And so notice out in the, uh, in the, uh, at the bookends, we have, you know, treatment, you know, what are we doing about what are we doing about treating what happens if we go beyond some level of risk tolerance? That's why up in that third block point, we have bolded outlining of the allowable exposures. And then of course, we're trying to set those parameters and those parameters could be anything that I described just, just a few minutes ago. So let's go ahead and go through some of these here. Value at risk, volatility, benchmarks, maximum lending, system availability, recovery times, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about inside of these last, we you know, what have they been? Six or seven uh, chapters. Let's go ahead and move on to the next learning objective regarding regulatory capital. So let's go ahead and skip down to the bottom here. So here are the key elements of this uh, ERM framework, regulatory capital, economic capital, risk adjusted, return on capital, and then uh, capital aggregation. So we'll go ahead and talk about those in the next handful of slides, but let me go ahead and make a couple of comments here before we move on. Uh, notice the second block point there, uh, essential for mitigating unexpected losses and man maintaining solvency. So that's really an important part of this section of the chapter and probably a likely exam question. Maintaining solvency, you know, so the Basel people, they decided that you've got to have this much regulatory capital and this much economic capital. And, and so this can be applied, of course, to individual institutions. But then remember in a previous slide, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, things like uh, the parameters. We talked about benchmarking. And so it's important for this financial institution to know or at least have a sense of what's going on over here in one of its main competitors or even some other financial institution. Remember that comment and that bullet point about lessons learned, we can learn internally and then we can learn externally. I'm guessing there are lots of banks out there who are trying to learn lessons from uh, SVB. All right, so let's start with regulatory capital. And this is probably the oldest form of a capital requirement. I, I imagine the Bank of the Roman Empire, if there was such a thing oh, way back in those days, they probably had some kind of, uh, of a definition of the amount of capital that a bank needs, you know, given all of these kinds of rules, because we've got short-term deposits essentially and long-term assets over there. So that regulatory capital is a function of lots of different things, but you know, a lot of it is, is composed of that mismatch. So what does that say? Assures customers that their investments are protected, 
boy, I'm just going to scratch my head. I'll let you guys scratch your head there and say, are our deposits protected? Are bonds protected? I don't really know. However, we're not really taking, we're not really taking current events and throwing them in here. That's just my editorialization. I love this third teardrop point talking about risk weighted assets. So, you know, we have had uh, super conversations about that. So the cook ratio, 8%. I can't imagine that the, uh, the association would ask you about 8%, but you guys probably know that in your regular business. Uh, yeah, Basel II extended that to include uh, market risk and then uh, Basel III, a further 2.5%. So y you probably ought to know those. I mean, I, I don't think they're really, really good exam questions, but I would know them if I were going into the exam. So let's talk about these uh, these three pillars. So we have regulatory capital. You know, this part of the chapter refers to it as minimum capital requirements to cover those risks that we've been talking about. And then we need to worry about the factors that's unique to each institution and then unique to each type of those risks. That goes back into pillar one. Uh, and then pillar three, market discipline. I'm going to go ahead and put on my editorial hat and say, boy, you know, in pure uh, free enterprise systems, market discipline, this is really high pressure. But when you have governments there who are willing to bail out, then uh, then market discipline probably loses some some of its edge. But look at what we have in bold over there, mandatory disclosures so that there's information. So once again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, about communication and awareness and remember you know what i'm going to go ahead and go back here just even though it's pretty far uh i'm going to go back here and say something like look what we're trying to do remember now we're not we're not pushing up but we're flowing all of this this information the oversight right and the the assurance and uh the assertion and the reporting right we're doing all of this stuff pushing it upwards towards the board of directors, you know, that information is flowing upwards. So let me make sure I don't go too far here. Where, where, uh, where am I? Right, these disclosures that then come from the board of directors. And so look at that first part of the sentence there. Informed decisions uh, imposing these mandatory disclosures. And so that this should make perfect sense, right? Now let me give you my quick... Uh, quick personal example of this economic cap capital. Notice we've got this probability distribution. So it's a little bit skewed if that makes perfect sense, but we have this expected loss and then the unexpected loss. And so of course the traditional kind of way of looking at expected loss is let's go back to my silo for, what did I say? Commercial loans, 50,000 to 250,000. So we know, let's suppose we have a hundred loans inside of that silo. Well, we know from history, we know from uh, simulations, we know from our experience, we know from lots of different things that we're going to have a certain amount of loss inside of those 100 loans. So that's the that's the economic loss. So, you know, let's just suppose that, uh, you know, that loss is this big, right? So that's the regulatory capital that we need on the right hand side of our balance sheet. But then, but then we're going to have some unexpected losses. So remember that expected loss is based on you know, let's just say historical distributions that include things like regular old, regular old recessions, regular old normal economies, regular old expanding economies. But then let's go back a couple of years and let's throw in COVID. You know, that would be an unexpected loss. So we still have, you know, we still have these hundred loans and they still have their expected loss. But then what happens if something unexpected occurs, right? Unforeseen, like like COVID. Uh, I'm reading a fascinating book right now. I, I read The Big Short. Hopefully you guys read that Big Short, but this dude also wrote a book on COVID. And it's just a fascinating book on risk management. And so just throw that in there as an unexpected loss. And so that's economic capital. And so we stop, we start with, you know, let's make sure you get this. We start with the limit of the expected loss. And then everything beyond that is the unexpected loss. And we could stop, you know, here I'm going in that red direction. We could stop after, you know, let's say uh, this much on the slide, you know, maybe that's, uh, you know, $10. We could just stop, but notice that it's based on a level of confidence. Look at that embedded uh, uh, 
bullet point. It would be too costly to operate at the 100% level, right? We don't want to completely have an economic capital that takes us out to 100% because then we are probably not going to have any uh, any substantial or reasonable or acceptable uh, return on equity or any other kind of measurement or metric that we want to use. So we're truncating that on the right end at the confidence level. Maybe it's 95%, maybe it's 98%, maybe it's whatever that comes. But remember that determination of the confidence level that comes from the chief risk officer and it comes from the board of directors based on all those things that we have been talking about. So look over in that far right side, losses so remote that capital is not provided to cover them. Now, I guess some of us, and we could make the reasonable argument that COVID is maybe is not a part of that unexpected loss. Maybe that's all the way out there. But I can assure you that after uh, uh, 2019 and 2020, that financial institutions are throwing some type of a, uh, of a flu or a virus uh, inside of that unexpected loss. All right, so here's just another example. What, what was I saying earlier? I used that term and the reading em emphasized this about solvency. So that depends entirely on, you know, things like credit risk. So there we go. We have a bank that has triple A rating, uh, default probability of 0.01%. And so what does that mean? 99.99% confidence. So that economic capital would be uh, sufficient to cover up to 99.99. I always scratch my head when we get up to those percentages near 100%, wondering, is it worth the extra cost, just an opportunity cost to have that economic capital so that we forego, you know, maybe some positive net present value loans that are out there. Now, what have we talked about uh, inside of the FRM program? And going back to your uh, maybe your graduate school days and your undergraduate school days, what are some important elements, some important metrics of return? You know, the, the chapter discusses return on equity, which is just some simple accounting rate of return on uh, total equity provided, right? And then moves on to return on capital, which is essentially return on assets. But that's what's unique based on all the stuff that we're talking about inside of the FRM program. It's unique to financial institutions. We need to calculate this risk adjusted return on capital. So notice in the numerator, uh, the after tax adjusted net income that is expected over here. Let me go back here real quick over that economic capital. So what this does is it is it fills in the gaps that ROE and ROC do not measure. And so look at the second arrow point, more suitable for assessing uh, credit risks. Uh, and so this is super important. And notice that embedded point, not often uh, used for operational risks. Yeah, funding costs, managing capital, uh, different levels of at, at the business lines or the portfolio level or at the transaction level. And then we get into uh, uh, aggregation. So there are some pictures there of credit risk. These are just different distributions. And don't be upset that you're looking at them and saying, hey, you know what, Jim, those are not uh, normal distributions because the, the chapter actually has a normal distribution uh, picture in it. But, you know, we, we would like, especially in the academic world, we would love to think that the, uh, that the environment revolves around normal distributions. But we know that there are crazy distributions out there, especially at the, uh, at the, at the, left side of the tail when we're talking about value risk and expected uh, exposure and all those kinds of things. And so what are we trying to do? Notice our very clever, you know, little arrows there, uh, aggregation. So we have this aggregated capital distribution uh, out, on, uh, out on the right. And so what do we know? We know that these distributions are probably not symmetric. We probably know that they are subject to different kinds of dynamics. Uh, each business silo uh, might be exposed to different types and different layers and levels of regulation. That's why we have in that second block point, this is known as inter-risk diversification. Uh, 
which of course is in addition to intra risk diversification. And so just think of all of those different kinds of silos as they relate to, as they relate to, well, let me just go back here real quick, as they relate to regulatory capital and economic capital. Stress testing, we've been down this road many, many times before. So I've said this to you, and let me just remind you, think of stress testing as uh, a conversation about what's the worst thing that can happen. Let's go ahead and make certain, and I'm gonna go ahead and emphasize this word solvency again, but the, uh, the chapter emphasizes the word stability. So that's probably a really good uh, potential exam question. Stress testing, we're saying, okay, let's suppose we put all these stressors inside of our Excel spreadsheet. I always think stress testing as an Excel spreadsheet, but uh, you know, because that's the way it, uh, that I do it inside of my classroom, but you guys can do it with you know, Monte Carlo or any kind of algorithm. You have access to all that kind of really awesome, uh, boy, maybe, it's an, maybe it's even a part of machine learning or artificial intelligence, but that is stability. That's the key, that's the key word. And so notice what else we have on that block point, beyond normal operating capacity. So how are we going to stress this? Well, in my classes, uh, most of the time we stress these with microeconomic variables. You know, I'll change something like the dividend or I'll change something like the asset allocation or I'll change uh, something like, you know, maybe we'll substitute a stock in for another stock. But of course, here with financial institutions, we're probably focusing on extreme macroeconomic conditions. And so what the chapter emphasizes are things that we're talking about uh, in current events, inflation, COVID, uh, high interest rates, changes in GDP, all, all those kinds of good things. Now, of course, GARP is very interested in providing us with history lessons. And so, and as well, it should be, because I'm a big fan of history. You know, going back to the 2008 financial crisis, hey, what did we learn back then, right? This is all part of learning. And then how can we, uh, organize and construct our stress testing so that it kind of replicates, I don't want to say duplicates, but replicates the, you know, the economic conditions back in 2005 and 2006 leading up to that. And that is the part, a super component, important component of essential risk management tool, which helps determine what that adequate capital is. Now, of course, we got the regulators telling us what we ought to have, and then we have our own chief risk officer telling us, okay, this is what we probably ought to have in the event of a large shock. Now, when I do this in my classes, I typically don't change it dramatically because I typically do it in computing the net present value for a capital budgeting project, but the chapter emphasizes a large shock. I mean, COVID is clearly uh, a large shock. Uh, and maybe not COVID, but maybe the government response to COVID is, is the large shock. All right, so what about these uh, BCBS uh, principles that we get from uh, the Basel people? So here are nine of these. Boy, I'm, you know, I'm struggling to come up with a really good uh, question stem that doesn't relate to each one of these principles. So go ahead and get out your phone and take a picture of this slide, notice what we've done. We put together some bolded words in there that might help you answer some of these questions on the exam. So what do we start with? You know, well-defined objective, that, that makes perfect sense. A governance structure, uh, use these risk management tools and framework to make business decisions. Then we wanna capture material and relevant risk. So think about that fourth uh, principle there. That, that is the beginning of what we talked about in the beginning of this, of this slide deck with the identifying risk, right? We wanna identify that, so capture material and relevant risks. Then we have organizational structures to meet those objectives of all of the stress testing. So we're identifying those important risks, which, let me go back here just really quickly. Uh, look at the second block point. What the, that identification then will lead us to identify what those factors inside of the macro economy are. And then we have our information technology systems. Of course, we need to say something like, all right, what happens, what happens if that machine over there blows up? I mean, that's a shock. Sounds to me like, like that's a shock. Uh, 
And then we have to pick, we have to pick the methods and the models that are going to be used. Now, of course, in my capital budgeting model, once we get to the end, we have to pick an interest rate. And so, you know, of course, we use the capital asset pricing model. Um, sometimes I'll just say, hey, here's the result from the arbitrage arbitrage pricing model or some other model. So different scenarios might have different interest rates. They might have uh, different economic variables and they might have different models. Uh, how about monitoring, right? Challenge and reviews. And then you're not surprised on that last one. So communication. All right, so how about this taxonomy of stress testing? We'll start with uh, two dimensions, the quantitative, qualitative approach. So what we're going to do, this is what I do. We're going to change those parameters inside of the model. I do, you know, kind of tiny changes here. We're going to do parameter shocks. Yeah, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, qualitative approaches focuses more on what happens if we have an expanding economy. What happens if we have a depressing economy? And so uh, that quantitative and qualitative approach, and the chapter kind of emphasizes this, that you know what we want to go, and we want to make sure that we do one and we do the other, and then we see the linkage between the two. And we can do this with parameter stress testing, which is what I just described, and the macro stress testing, looking at each of those factors. And then we can do this reverse stress testing, which I never do in class because I'm not quite sure how to, uh, to, how to bring it uh, to life inside of an Excel spreadsheet sheet. But this reverse stress testing, you say something like, okay, what happens if every, and let me go back to my 100 loans. What happens if every one of those 100 loans defaults? Some are 50,000, some are 80,000, some are 220,000. What happens if every one of those defaults? And then we do the reverse. We just do the flow chart all the way back and we try to pinpoint what was the cause you know, haven't we done root cause analysis before? What was the cause, the initial cause that led to that m monstrously bad outcome? And maybe it's just that, hey, you know what? Someone had a headache as a loan officer the day that those 100 loans were granted and the due diligence was not performed. And so we can find that. And so then maybe what we can do is say, you know what, maybe our employees are under lots of stress and they get headaches. So let's go ahead and before lunch, let's put some uh, machinery over there. Let's do some yoga over there. Let's do something where our employees can uh, uh, decompress or relieve their stress or whatever, whatever it is they want to do. Do you see how that reverse stress testing might lead to a different kind of a stress outcome? Nevertheless, what are we trying to do? We're trying to establish some kind of a scenario under which we can say, you know what, regardless of what happens, we're still going to be a stable financial institution. Moving on to the second dimension, measurable and immeasurable risk. Uh, interesting that the chapter uses two words, one of which I know about. They use the word probabilistic. So look at that measurable risks there. Uh, and so what do we know? We know we can do stress testing for market and credit risk. Uh, we can do tail risk modeling. But what about these immeasurable risk? Uh, the other word that the chapter uses is possibilistic. And I love using words that don't really uh, have a, def, a, a quick knowledge, uh, but you, exact, you know exactly what it means. So possibilistic, and that means this unknown unknowns. And this was developed, uh, I don't know, sometime in the 1960s by a dude named Frank Wright. And it was used in the United States uh, in the early 2000s about what the uh, what the unknown unknowns are. Let me just give you a quick example. But we know, let me go down to the bottom there. We know about stress testing, right? We know about tail risk modeling. Well, what about these unknown unknowns? Let's suppose that I'm, uh, I'm Jim's bank and you come up to me as a potential bondholder or shareholder and you say, hey, Jim, what's your level of interest rate risk going to be in five years? And I look at you like, oh my goodness gracious, how am I possibly uh, supposed to know what that is? So that's an unknown unknown because who knows what interest rate risk is going to look like in five years or 10 years. But, you know, think about that, you know, future economic activity that's just not measurable, right? 
measurable versus immeasurable risk. So what about these types of stress testing? So this is a little bit more detail on what I gave you uh, just a few moments ago. So model stress testing or verifying accuracy and reliability of the model's parameters. So we do this stress test and we, saw, and we say something like, here are the initial conditions. We don't want to go past this boundary. Maybe there's some other relevant factors in there. Then what happens to, well, let me just pick uh, something. Let's suppose beta. What, what happens to the beta of our client's portfolio if we stress it by throwing in COVID or throwing in spikes in inflation, that kind of stuff? Now, of course, what we can do is we can then take that another step and look at the macro stress testing and looking specifically at what happens to not just our client's portfolio, but you know, in each of our different silos to changes in exchange rates or interest rates or prices of credit default swaps or whatever factor that we want to throw in there. And then there's uh, some examples of reverse stress testing. So this is what I was saying, portfolio losses, credit rating downgrades, uh, major client losses. So we can work our way backwards to try to, try to figure out what that is. All right, I said this at the very beginning, I'll go ahead and repeat it. What are these challenges and considerations, model inadequacy? You know, do we have COVID in there? Do we have uh, crashing in the credit default swap market, you know, probably, well, what is, what do we have in the bull, in the bold there vastly exceeded any prescribed test, uh, misconceptions. Yeah. A true macro test should result in a change in the loss distribution itself. That's why I made that comment earlier about, you know, those distributions. What are these key components expected non-legal loss, uh, legal loss and idiosyncratic scenario loss. And so these are exactly what you might think that their names suggest. Estimate losses for each, each risk type. And then, you know, what about litigation? Uh, what about each individual bank? So how do we model these operational risk lo losses? We probably know this. We can use regression models. And let's not forget to include time series models in there and all of the problems that are included in those time series. But remember, I've said this to you before, if you can fix all of those problems in a time series, there's tremendous value uh, in the output. Now, the loss distribution approach, this is Monte Carlo stuff, and it can be super valuable, but you got to take a step back. Um, what it does is it assumes that these risk exposures probably have constant distributions. So that's always considered a secondary pro approach. So I would remember LDA secondary. That's probably okay um, before an exam question. But then we can modify it to try to figure out if it in is including for dynamic risk environments. So the modified or the conditional uh, loss distribution approach. So that takes us through, you know, four pretty simple learning objectives, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, I tried to give you some good examples of what exam questions might look like. So, hey, thanks for watching and uh, good luck studying.